Hey guys, Coach here. Hey, thanks for taking a couple of minutes. As you can see, we're talking about hillside plantings and using green material to stabilize your back or front yard that you maybe don't want to get involved in retaining walls. So we're going to do it with plant material alone with a little bit of help. Hey, I'm Matt. You can call me Coach. I'm glad you're here. Let's get this episode rolling, shall we? You know, I've spoken about it in other episodes, and there is no doubt that hardscape introduction to hillside stability and hillside landscaping can go a long ways and even eliminate erosion, etc. You can do that with a variety of things, and we've talked about it quite a bit. Stacked block, wood walls with dead man's back into the, into the hillside, um, concrete, uh, metals of some kinds, boulders, etc. But this week we're going to talk to you guys that maybe you just don't want to get involved with all that man-made material and you want to have a more natural looking hillside and you're going to do it strictly with Greenscape. You know later in the video I'll talk to you about several selections of plant material that I've had success with on the hillside landscapes that I was involved in when I was a contractor and designer. But today we're going to talk about uh, some of the plant material selections, and I mean that in very general terms. We're going to be looking for things that are not monstrosities. We're going to look for things that are going to be notorious for thick, fibrous roots that are going to establish fairly quickly within a growing season or so. And then we're going to look for uh, laying those hillsides out so that you have pretties down at eye level and stability towards the top. You know, this isn't anything new. If you go out into the mountains and into Mother Nature, you'll find that she's an expert, <laughs> literally for millennia, an expert on hillside stabilization. You go out into the hills and you'll see trees. Now granted, she often uses larger specimens, but she has the space to do it, right? Then she'll have medium shrubs, she'll have ground covers, she'll have grasses, and then she has a thing called forest duff, which is basically Mother Nature's uh, compost and mulch, and a combination of all these work together to stabilize some hillsides when they're not, you know, there's not a lot of rock and that kind of stuff involved. It's basically dirt hillsides for several inches underground. Now, does she lose once in a while? Yeah, that's where we see uh, large mudslides and landslides when there's just too much water. But you know something? I'll bet you at least half of those come from man-made interventions, from developing and that kind of stuff, or from wildfires, etc., where Mother Nature has lost all her uh, resiliency and her tenacity to hold those hillsides back. Big storms come in. I know it has happened in this past 22, 23 winter, especially on the western part of the U.S. There's quite a few mudslides and some rivers really took a lot of erosion down the hill. Since we're talking about residential application, we have to look at it from the aspect that we're not talking about huge. Now there are some of you out there, you're out in the rural areas, you're on acreage, you know, whatever you have. Um, you're going to take what I'm telling you today and just magnify it. That would be the best way to get anything from this lesson. But for most of you who are in the suburbs and you have backyards that are X number of feet wide and deep, but some of you might be down at the bottom end of a hill and maybe you have a neighbor above you, you have a neighbor way above you, you have another neighbor over here and you seem to be at the bottom of a funnel when it comes to water and water runoff. These are the people that I'm addressing. And if you know anybody that's in this situation, maybe as a new homeowner or a uh, existing homeowner and they have trouble with this, maybe you share this after you like it, you share this with them and maybe they'll get something out of it as well. So for some of you, maybe you take possession of a, a new home or a new home to you and you notice that there is this challenge that's in the front yard or the backyard. You have some incline out there and I've seen it as much as 30 degrees at times and I have worked on it at 15 to 20 degrees. It's not fun. It's quite a landscape challenge. And for you as a new homeowner, 
you're going to have to address this and address it fairly quickly if there is some destabilization that is present. And you can generally see that by washouts and uh, washings of soils down into the, the flatter part of your back or front yard or out onto the sidewalk. That's an indication that uh, the hillside is not stable and you can probably look at it and maybe it's a blank canvas. It's just dirt and rock and that kind of stuff up there or maybe you have just dirt out in the front yard because they took it from one place and pushed it out to another and it just hasn't been stable. Well then it is time to jump on it and jump on it fast depending on the time of year. If you know your weather patterns like the weather pattern that I had out in Northern California you know the rains were 90-95% done by this time of year, the end of May into June. Very seldom do we get anything. Occasionally you would have some monsoonal moisture that would come over the Sierra Nevada and dribble some out in the Central Valley in the mid to late summer. But that was the exception, not always the rule. What about you guys? I'd love to hear it in the comments below. Do you have something like this? Have you taken on something like this? And how did you solve it? What I might suggest is immediately, immediately go land your hands on some things called straw wattles. And I would like you to lay those straw wattles across your hillside, your problem hillside, spaced about every three to four feet apart, and then stake them down securely into the hill. You can even nestle them down into the dirt a little bit. The one thing about this lesson I want you to take away from, this is not a hillside that is 100% rock. This is hillsides that are amenable to planting. The soils are amendable so you can actually put something in the ground. If you have solid rock type of stuff, you're going to be really hard pressed and you're going to need to get a pro in there to chisel some things out and terrace this thing, backfill it with soils and make it a usable part of your yard. But what we're directing your attention to today is plantable hillsides. Like so many other episodes, we are going to attack this project just like any other landscape project. You can make a, a part of a whole backyard project or you can focus on it solely because maybe there's some uh, haste that you have to put into it because winter's coming or summer rains are coming or whatever it might be. So you kind of have to you kind of have to get on it. So we are going to plan, we are going to research, we're going to design, and we're going to execute. All these kinds of things are definitely listed in my 15-step DIY checklist, which you can find over at the website, which is listed somewhere here, as always, and it's in the description below. Whopping two bucks, and you'll get a step-by-step -step guide. Without approaching it with kind of a serious eye, and you just kind of throw something at it, um, almost like a weekend warrior attempt, you may have some success. You, you might. But wouldn't you rather sleep well at night when the heavens do open up? And for some of you out there, and Maestro and I have been in situations where two inches of rain overnight can come down. And if you're at the bottom of that hill and you've got your neighbor's washing coming your way, isn't it nice that you did it right the first time and successfully so you can sleep sound and you're not staring at the ceiling or going out there in your bathrobe and a flashlight to see what the hell might be going on. One of the things you're going to have to start with is you're going to have to do a little bit of a research as far as what plant material thrives in your area. I can name a whole bunch of plant material which I will name some and some will grow in multiple USDA zones but I don't know where you're at. So that's where your nursery recon and other things come into play. And now is the perfect time to do it. Nurseries are stocked full, probably as full as they're ever gonna be this month and the first half of next month. Get out there, find your nursery pro, get on a first name basis and say, this is my project. I'm not putting in retaining walls. I want to do this in green plant material. What are some of the selections you have in the form of trees and shrubs and ground cover that I could use? That is a huge, huge leg up on 90% of everyone else who takes on landscaping projects in a DIY form. 
So your initial steps was that straw wattle application. You're gonna stake those down with 16 inch stakes. You're gonna have them spaced, like I said, three to four feet apart, and you are just gonna leave them there. You're gonna leave them there throughout the entire process. You are not gonna take them away. Remember, initial plantings, initial plantings are a form of destabilization all on their own. You're digging into the hill, you're making soft soil, you're planting things, and it's not till those things get established and mature where your stabilization really comes from. So understand those straw wattles are gonna stay there. They will decompose over time. I have seen them decompose inside two years. And then later on, you just pick up the netting that the straw came in and you discard it correctly. So you've taken a few hours, maybe a few days, and put together a few sketches and maybe a final design. I hope your design goes along this kind of line of thinking. You're gonna to wanna to stabilize the top of the hillside to start with, with shrubbery, trees, ground covers, etc. And then as you bring this plant material down the hill, you can still have a few trees and a few shrubs but majority of it is going to be ground cover, perennials, mulch, etc. And in the end, your top of your top half of your hillside will be stabilized with plant material and your pretties are going to be the lower half. Why? So you can freaking enjoy them when you look at it next spring when they come up and they start blooming. They're doing their job underneath the soil for you and then they're saying, "Hey, here you go, bud, for all your hard work." Based on your research, you've probably found medium to fast growing selections of both trees, shrubs, perennials, and ground covers. We don't want a snail's pace here. We want something that you give it a minimum of a half a season of growing time. And the more you give it, the better. Now, just a little leg up on the whole all plant material thing. If you want to put some insurance policy into your project, how do you think you can do that without getting off into terracing and, and retaining walls? It's through drainage. And you can drain a hillside without having to get into terracing and retaining walls. You can put along horizontal parts of the hillside, you can put French drains in there and make them at just a slight downward angle, just a two degree pitch at the most. And you can connect it to a main drain on one side of your yard, run it down into the backyard, front yard, sidewalk, wherever it might go, and evacuate excess water. That way you're going to have a, a, little, a little insurance policy, shall we say, against anything catastrophic, say like a six, eight inches, or some places that we saw in the past couple years, 17 inches of rain in a 24 hour period. You would really, really be freaking out with that kind of water coming down. Hello, Waverly, Tennessee. So now we're dealing with the hillside. We're dealing with a hillside that has an angle. It could be, it could be 10 degrees, it could be 20 degrees, it could be 30 degrees, whatever, whatever it might be. Hillside planting techniques are much different than if you're planting something down on flat ground or near flat ground. We are never going to just dig into the hillside and put something in at this angle. We always plant vertically into stuff so water, moisture, and roots go down. They don't have to kind of try to establish themselves and come down out of the root ball down here. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So. Our planting technique is like the short I did, okay, earlier in the week. But right quick here on this hillside, I just want to show you a little trick. And that is every hillside needs to be planted so you have a flat basin for your plants. Dig into the hill above where you're going to put your plant, pull it down, flatten it out with your hand, and give yourself a basin. Then you can dig into the into the basin, take your plant, put it in there, tuck it down in, firm the basin on the downhill side, captures water, captures food, mulch it, and you'll have a much better success at hillside planting. 
See you on the channel on Friday. Bye for now. We are going to dig out the hillside up above, pulling the soil down, and we are going to create a basin that is flat in the middle of this angled hillside. Then we can dig out that flat part. We can plant our plant. We can plant our plugs of ground cover. We can plant our big tree. And then we backfill with our amended soil like any other planting we've ever talked about. And we really firm up that soil on the bottom side and on the back cupping. The back cupping of that basin, we want to pack that in. You can get fancy and you can put uh, fancy boulders behind each planting and then down in front. I've done that before. Helps stabilize that destabilized planting area. It looks nice. It looks natural. And you can take them out later when everything starts to grow in and fill over. There's a lot of lessons to be learned here today, but that one right there is super important. Understand that no matter how small a planting you're doing, we are going to plant down into the hillside. You're not going to plant plugs into the side of a hill. It takes a lot longer for it to establish, and it takes a while for the plant to go, what the heck, I'm supposed to be going up. So plant it vertically in the first place. Let's take a few, uh, a few minutes and look at some selections. I could have made the list e extremely long, but these are just ones that I've used and I've used them repeatedly with great success. You will notice that I don't have any that are super big. Everything I would rather have you plant is medium to small and numerous. That way you have fibrous root systems going out everywhere, but not enough to overwhelm the hillside, taking all the nutrients out or having trees or shrubs that get so big they start shading out other things and weakening the shrubbery and other things that you've invested in. So let's start off with trees. Medium to small trees is what I suggest for the average residential suburbia hillside plantings. Here are some selections and I'm gonna go through them kind of fast. Number one is some of the medium to smaller maples. Japanese maple, vine maples, bohol maples, Tartarian maple, box elder maples. All these type of maples, they don't get really big. They are deciduous, but we're looking for the stabilization the root system is going to give you, not the canopy right now. The canopy will, as it matures, will tend to slow down the impact of rain when it comes through the tree canopy and it releases the water a lot slower and a lot easier. Number two, a lot of the medium-sized birches. One of my favorite birches of all time is the Giacomonte birch. It works well. Most of the time, depending on where you're growing it, it's not really good in the desert southwest. It's much more of a uh, sandy, loamy type of thriver, and it can go into the mountains very easily. Giacomonte birch works well. There's also the young eye birch, which is kind of a interesting birch that likes to weep and grow and twist and very unusual birch. Check that one out. And the other one is the Nana birch. Nana birch is just a, a smaller, thicker version of the Giacomonte. Something many people don't think about, but I'd like you to consider it, and that is semi-dwarf and dwarf fruit trees. They do have kind of an involved, dense root system most of the time. They can get roots down two, three, and four feet if your soil allows such, and then you get the, the obvious benefit in the growing season, in the summertime, to go harvest. What a better thing. Beautiful blooms in the spring. Nice, medium-sized, small canopy, and then fruit as well. Think about cherry, plum, peach, any, any one of them will work really, really well. Number four is evergreens. Evergreens that uh, 
are from the spruce family, the cypress family, uh, even the juniper family. We're talking about evergreens. These things are the masters of dense root systems, and they are great at holding hillsides. Columnar junipers along your hillside fence area or across the top for additional privacy. Clustered in threes and fives up in the upper corners. Maybe threes down in the lower corners. Any of these, just remember your spacing and remember the mature size. Okay, let's talk about shrubbery. Number one, right out of the gate just picking up on where I left off, and that is ground level junipers, small juniper to medium sized junipers. They can be almost any kind. They can be native to your area, they could be ornamentals from the nursery, anything that you can find. The more juniper you can get in there, especially like blue rug juniper and, and other ones, uh, buffalo juniper, these guys really do well on hillside stabilization. Number two, one of my favorites, and I used it quite frequently, is the ground cover rose. Generally, the drift variety is what I always tried to search out for. Beautiful color through spring and summer, and you can nip and tuck it to whatever you desire, or if you want to let it go rampant, you can do that too. I like taking them back about a third and kind of keeping them somewhat under control and allowing space for other things but check out uh, ground cover roses, the drift variety. Another one I like is Dutzia. Dutzia is an ornamental deciduous shrub, gorgeous spring color, uh, great, great green. You can get the varieties that go about three to four feet or so, and then they have some fall color as well. Check out Dutzia. It's one of my plants of the week as well. Also, keep in mind ornamental grasses. Now, I would suggest that you get perennial grasses and not annual grasses. Uh, Penstemon is a beautiful, beautiful annual grass. You can even get them in some zones that they'll carry over to the next year, but they tend to seed up really bad. Um, if you want to do it, ah, it's a personal choice. I think you should stay with perennial grasses. Stay with uh, things from the, uh, the dwarf miscanthus varieties, the calamagrostis varieties, the mulembergia varieties, the festuca varieties. Uh, all of those work really well and the grass roots tend to stabilize things really, really fast. And you can see out of this sandy, sandy box here with grass, how much sand this baby little grass is hanging on to. So remember ornamental grasses, they really do a very good job. Another one that I used a lot, and that's Kinnikinnik, that's your Manzanita family. I used uh, emerald carpet a whole lot, and it does a fantastic job. Spacing is critical, and make sure you group it with plant material that it gets along with. It does not like wet feet whatsoever. Another one is Cotoneaster. Cotoneaster family, the ground hugging varieties is best, and they do a fantastic job with a great spring bloom and berries for the birds later in the winter. Lastly, one of my favorites is Russian Sage. Russian Sage is a fast grower. It's a perennial. It'll tend to die up on top and then it'll come back from the base every single year. Fantastic lavender blue flowers and it's very, very fast to establish. Okay, let's talk about ground covers and wrap this up. Number one, although I have heard a few comments about Vinca, Periwinkle, that it's poisonous to dogs. Why would you ever put it in the yard? 
all the landscapes I did and all the customers' dogs that I was around and the times that I used Vinca never saw the dogs attracted to it. But if you got dogs and you want to stay away from it, stay away from it. I would also stay away from the variety called Vinca Major. It's a little too aggressive for my taste, especially in smaller yards, so stick with the Vinca Minor, either the variegated one or the green one. Fantastic spring color, really is. All right, I bet you you didn't think I was going to talk about this one, but I am. What about ivy? And I'm going to be really specific about which kinds. I only used needlepoint, needlepoint ivy. I stayed away from the Algerian, and I stayed away from the Hans. The needlepoint ivy tends to be a lot more controllable and a lot more manageable, and it does a great job as far as stabilizing that soil. It tends to have a much smaller leaf, much narrower and needle-like leaf, even though it's lobed, and it's a good use. It really is. And you can replace it, and it's readily available. And one of my favorites, it was even out on the hillside I was showing you at the beginning. However, we were a little far away, but Creeping Phlox. Creeping Phlox does a great job. This time of year, it's in its glory. Either the white, the purple, uh, the pinkish reddish ones, the lavender ones, they're a fantastic. Mix and match them for a really unique color palette too. Creeping Phlox is a good one for soil stabilization because of its roots. If you have a shady area on this hillside, maybe because of neighbors, trees or whatever, do not forget about ferns. Ferns have a very, very dense, dense fibrous root system. You can use them repeatedly in the shadier areas. Morning sun is fine, and then uh, afternoon shade. Lastly, the Carex family, which is a cousin of the grass family. Carexes really do well. They're very, very hardy. Uh, you can get some that go down below zero and then some that kind of get picky around the freezing temperatures. So do your research, find ones that really work for you. There's green ones and variegated ones, and you can use them. Now, going into perennials, carte blanche on anything 18 inches or lower. You can do whatever you want intersperse them with all these other selections I've talked about. You can even go off into bulb selections and stuff because bulbs do have a heck of a root system. You know, like you can get into daylilies and amaryllis and, and daffodils and tulips and air, all that stuff. If you get really fancy and you want to tuck in boulders into the hillside because you have some heavy equipment, you're a fancy, fancy guy or gal, then you can tuck those kinds of things in and around and really, really kick up the aesthetic appeal quite a bit. Hey, one thing that I want to leave you with, and that is if your hillside is steep, and we're talking 20 plus degrees or more, try to consider putting in some type of stepping stone pathway type of navigation on the hillside. I would generally suggest crisscrossing at lower angles up the hill so you have accessibility. And this would be one thing that you might want to consider before you even get to planting. That way you can navigate the hill, you can maintain it, inspect it, and do all kinds of things, and still be able to have a wonderful, natural looking hillside. So remember navigation on the hillside as well. Hey, there you go. Hillside plantings without retaining walls, using just plant material, greenscape approach to it, do not skimp on the plant material here. We want things to fill in very, very fast. And if you have to thin a little bit, five years, 10 years down the road, so be it. Stability is the main thing we focused on here today. Hey, don't forget the website over there at youryardcoach.com. Thank you for those who perused and picked up the freebie. Hey, check out the book and the course. Works out really well. The Amazon store is always, always open to you. And it is down right about here. And if you want to learn about a little bit more about retaining walls and some of the videos I did then, here's a link right here that you can check out. Go check out that video if you want to start doing some building building, and I wish you the best of luck. I'm only an email away, youryardcoach at gmail.com if you have some questions. Thanks to those who sent in this week. So I'll catch you guys next Friday. If you're on the go, check out the podcast. Thanks for staying with me. I would appreciate a subscription, and give me a like if you got some value out of this. 
Bye for now.